course. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. And uh, also thanks to the organizers for allowing me to uh, uh, present to you my uh, work uh, remotely all the way from uh, California. So this is a, a joint work with Frédéric Grossens, Elham Kashifi, and uh, Damien Markham from Sorbonne University. And uh, the main subject is uh, efficiency of uh, boson sampling uh, experiment. And uh, if time allows, I'll also mention a related uh, application to this work. Um, so the uh, main uh, theme uh, of uh, this subject is uh, the so-called quantum speed up, which is when a quantum computer is performing efficiently a task which uh, is intractable for uh, classical computers. And a celebrated ex example of this is given by factoring, which is believed to be hard um, for classical computers. We believe that it's hard to, uh, you know, integers very, uh, to factor very large uh, integers using classical computers. And, and indeed, we've based, uh, you know, most of the privacy of our communications on, on that uh, lonely belief. And uh, as it turns out, we have a, an efficient uh, algorithm that theoretically allows someone with a quantum computer to, to perform this uh, computational task efficiently. So one way to demonstrate this, this quantum speed up would be to you know, have like build your, your quantum computer and run Scholl's algorithm to factor a very large uh, integer. But it, as it turns out, of course, the, the quantum circuit to do so is, is uh, hard to build. The, the algorithm is not uh, trivial. And, and, and thus, this is not a viable uh, route in the near term to, to achieve such a demonstration. So if the goal is to demonstrate quantum speed up, um, this requires uh, three things. So the first thing that you'd need is something which is hard for classical computers, like, like factoring. Um, but on, on the other hand, you would need uh, a quantum device that can solve the hard problem and that, is, uh, that you can implement in the near term. And uh, last but not least, you also want a way to verify that the quantum device, uh, assuming that you've built this, this simple quantum device, uh, you want to, to check that the quantum device indeed solved the hard problem and was not a too noisy version of, of the device you were trying to build. So this kind of line of uh, thought sparked a very big line of research in the last uh, 10 years. And there are many examples of uh, computation, computational models that are so-called sub-universal quantum computational models that have been introduced. Um, so for example, boson sampling, random circuit sampling. And the first claims, uh, experimental claims of quantum speed up uh, have been recently made. So the first one was by uh, Google in 2019 and uh, their platform was a uh, superconducting uh, qubit processor. And the way they kind of verified that their circuit was uh, doing the right thing is they uh, tested specific uh, properties of the output priority distribution of uh, their quantum uh, circuit, specific benchmarks. Um, and then a bit more uh, recently, um, the University of Science and Technology uh, of China uh, reported the uh, demonstration of quantum speed up using uh, photons. <clears throat> so here the implementation uh, is closer to the theme of this conference uh, is uh, fully uh, optical and um, the computational uh, task uh, was Gaussian boson sampling. The, the quantum device is a 100 modes uh, optical interferometer. And again, the way they check that the device was uh, working well was uh, in part by uh, you know, verifying specific benchmarks uh, of the output probability distribution uh, of the full um, setup. And, um, and so I, I keep talking about these you know, verification of specific properties and not verification of the full uh, computation. So you may ask why didn't these two experiments verify the full uh, computational task. And the reason for this is actually somewhat intuitive. The, it's because of the nature of the computational task at, uh, at hand. So um, essentially, if you see the quantum speed of experiment as some black box that outputs some you know, random classical numbers, what you're doing is sampling from a specific probability distribution. And, and the um, you know, task, the, the, the target task is to sample from a specific ideal probability distribution corresponding to your uh, computational model. And it's very hard to check such a, that such a computational task was performed correctly because you're getting a bunch of random numbers and you're asked to check whether they come from the right distribution. So you can actually show that um, this is impossible to do efficiently uh, directly. Like if I'm just given the sample and I'm asked to check whether they come from the right distribution or, or a, even a distribution which is close to, to the right distribution, uh, this cannot be done efficiently. And uh, the reason is somewhat perverse. It's because the, all of these sampling models um, 
have uh, output priority distributions that anti-concentrate, that, that don't have you know, many uh, concentration peaks on, on specific uh, outcomes. And, and for that reason, they kind of look flat. And so it's very hard. Um, they, they don't have like precise signatures just with the probabilities. And so instead, uh, if this is not uh, efficient, we, we need to, to you know, find other methods and, and existing methods like the one I mentioned for uh, Google and USTC uh, are making strong assumptions in the sense um, they are introducing some partial verification and, and making the conjecture that uh, this partial verification is, as, you know, is sufficient um, to, to verify the full uh, computational task. So of course, this is close to the best thing that we, we can do right now. So, so of course we should do it, but we can also ask, is there, is there other approaches that would allow us to verify um, you know, quantum speed up experiments? And so the approach that we've taken in our work uh, is to um, try instead to make no assumption whatsoever about what's going on in the quantum uh, experiment. But assumes that, uh, but assume that that we have access to measurements that we trust. So you can think of this setting as uh, the same one as quantum tomography, where there's some you know uh, black box that output uh, an unknown quantum state, and you want to make measurements on that state and essentially analyze uh, the output state of of your uh, experiment. And um, so we've been trying to um, obtain verification protocols based on this approach for boson sampling. And there are two kind of immediate points that arise when you think about the setting. Um, so the first one is we've kind of shifted the task from you know, verification of the output probability distribution or the output classical samples to verification of the output quantum state. So can we make a link between these two um, you know, tasks? Otherwise, we won't be able to say anything meaningful about verification of quantum speed up using, using this setup. And the other thing is that the output states of quantum speed up experiments are, you know, like um, very entangled states over uh, many uh, subsystems, and in general, making tomography of a you know fully generic um, multi-system uh, quantum state uh, is exponential in the number of uh, subsystems. Like uh, the number of samples you need is is not efficient, and so we may also ask: Is this approach really going to give efficient protocol? Is this uh, really simpler? So in the rest of the talk, I'll. I'll uh, you know, answer these uh, two questions in the positive. Um, and uh, so first I'll, I'll, I'll just review briefly the uh, boson sampling uh, model that uh, I guess most of you have uh, already uh, seen. Um, so the boson sampling model we're looking at is the original one as introduced by Arendt and Arkhipov a bit more than uh, 10 years ago now. <clears throat> and it's a computational uh, linear optical computational model where in input you have some single photons and, and vacuum state they uh, go through um, a passive linear interferometer and at the output you measure the, the photon number. This gives you some probability distribution. And um, Arndt and Arkhipov showed that this probability distribution is, is hard to sample for a uh, classical computer. And uh, importantly, they showed that this still holds uh, approximately in the sense that if the computational task is not to sample from an ideal probability distribution P, uh, which is which characterize the output of you know this ideal uh, boson sampling, but rather to sample from a noisy probability distribution, which you know merely has some closeness to the ideal one in total variation distance, so as quantified by this bound, then this uh, task of sampling from this noisy probability distribution Q is still hard for uh, classical computers, and this is uh, under some um, you know com computational complexity uh, conjectures. Okay, so this means that in order to verify a boson sampling, uh, you know, quantum speed up experiment, we should check that the samples that we're given are actually sampled from a probability distribution, which is not too far in total variation distance from the ideal one. And we can relate this to the setting of verifi uh, verifying uh, output states. So if this is my, you know, boson sampler and I label the output state by uh, psi, and this is my uh, boson sampling uh, experiment, which I really look at at as a black box that outputs some you know, multi-mode uh, unknown mixed state uh, row. Then it turns out that the fidelity between these two states, the theoretical uh, you know, ideal state and the experimental state, any lower bound on this fidelity directly translates to an upper bound on the total variation distance between two probability distributions. And these probability distributions correspond to um, the probability distributions that you would get by, by making any measurement on rho, uh, that would be q rho, and the same measurement on psi, and that would be p psi. So if we were able to obtain good lower bounds 
uh, on the fidelity, then we're able to verify um, quantum speed up uh, experiments, and, and in this case, uh, boson sampling. And so uh, the main result uh, of our work is that this can actually be done efficiently, obtaining these lower bounds on the fidelity. Um, so what we get is an efficient verification of the output states of boson sampling experiment. And I'll talk about the measurements that are needed for this uh, verification in the next slide. These are uh, Gaussian measurements. And what the verification protocol does is it estimates uh, what we call a fidelity witness. So it's a tight lower bound uh, on the fidelity. And the tightness is quantified by this uh, theoretical bound. So you can show that the lower bound that you obtain from the verification protocol um, w, so it's indeed a lower bound on the, on, on the fidelity. And when the fidelity is close to one, it becomes tight. So this goes to one when the fidelity, fidelity goes to one. And so W is close to um, the, the fidelity. So it's indeed a tight lower bound on the fidelity. And importantly, you can get access to an estimate of this uh, lower bound uh, with a number of samples that scales like uh, m square log m, where m is the number of mode. So this is a you know, dramatic improvement compared to the exponential scaling of uh, tomography, for example. OK, so the, the measurement setup that you need uh, in order to implement this protocol is the so-called heterodyne detection. Some, some also call it a double homodyne uh, detection. And it, it is essentially what it is. So uh, you have a double homodyne detection out the output uh, of a beam speeder. So this is your single mode state that you want to measure. Uh, you split it onto a beam speeder, and then you measure both output uh, arms with um, with um, homodyne detection. You get two real values, and you can assemble uh, these two values uh, to form some complex number. So effectively, this uh, you know measure some row and project it onto some coherent states of complex amplitude uh, alpha. And and this detection, uh, this is when the detection is balanced because it comes in two flavors. Either the beam sphere here is balanced or unbalanced. Um, and when it's balanced, uh, this gives you projection onto coherent states, and this is what we need for the verification uh, protocol. So now the protocol looks like this. You just, it's essentially the same setup as tomography. You just repeat many times, uh, you know, you, you do many runs of your boson sampling experiment. Each time you get some, uh, you know, M mode uh, state, and then you measure all the, the single modes with uh, heterodyne detection. You obtain a bunch of complex numbers. Um, and then uh, you collect all the data. You do some uh, classical post processing, which is where the, uh, the magic uh, happens. And uh, this uh, classical post processing gives you an estimate of the tight um, lower bound of the fidelity that I mentioned before. So at this point, at, at this point, this is nice. It means that if you're trusting heterodyne, uh, you know, measurements, then you can obtain a certificate on the total variation distance. Uh, of the priority distribution corresponding to this state for any measurement and the ideal boson sampling one. But the problem is here, now if you want to perform the quantum speed up experiment, you still need to measure that guy with uh, photon number detection. And so it means you need to trust both the heterodyne detection and the photon number detection, heterodyne for the verification and photon number for the, um, uh, the quantum speed up uh, de task demonstration. And there's actually a way around this where you can consider this uh, model, which we developed in an uh, earlier paper, uh, where it's essentially boson sampling, but you replace the uh, photon number uh, detectors by unbalanced heterodyne detection. So this heterodyne detection with unbalanced beam speeder at the beginning. And we showed that this uh, also gives rise to output priority densities that are um, hard to sample for, for classical computers. And this means you can switch between verification and uh, quantum uh, demonstration of quantum speed up. Uh, now, just by shifting the you know, reflectivity, transmittivity of your beam splitter in the heterodyne detection, and you, you no longer need these uh, photon number uh, detection. And this also has the advantage that homodyne detection is available uh, very efficiently. So this is uh, also an interesting point. And so before I conclude, let me mention that these techniques that allow to uh, you know, give us lower bounds, robust lower bounds on uh, complex multimode, uh, on fidelities with complex multimode target state, have uh, many other applications beyond demonstration of uh, quantum speed up. And in particular, if you want to access quantum properties of some uh, you know, complex experimental state over, over many modes, then uh, tomography may not be uh, efficient. Uh, or even direct fidelity estimation. And so these techniques can al allow you to get uh, you know, a good lower bound on uh, these fidelities. And in turn, you can use these fidelities at, as witnesses for quantum properties. So we, we've uh, developed and applied this uh, ID in two subsequent uh, papers. Uh, this one uh, on Wigner uh, negativity, which is a theoretical work. And this one with experimental data, both on Wigner negativity and uh, stellar rank, which is another uh, non-Gaussian measure. 
So let me conclude here what I've presented to you is a, an efficient uh, theoretical protocol for the verification of uh, photonic quantum speed up using trusted measurements so in this setting. And it uses single mode, like a parallel single mode Gaussian measurements, a heterodyne measurement for the verification and the hard sampling task. And you can switch between the two tasks just by playing with the you know, reflectivity of that beam splitter just there. And finally, as other applications, it, it may uh, you know, allow you to recover quantum properties of, of complicated multi-mode states when tomography uh, no longer uh, can do it efficiently. So I'll uh, end there and I thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions you, you may have. Thanks a lot for the great talk. So questions, comments? Yes, we have a question. So thank you for the talk. Uh, so I maybe I missed it, but what is what is your assumption on the ideality of the heterodyne detector? Uh, can you have some noise level that is acceptable such that especially the second scheme that you presented would still work such that you there use a noisy detector for verification that's one question the other i am somehow worried in this double scheme of uh, systematic errors somehow adding together the way we wouldn't want them to add i see so um in in this uh, first protocol that this work was done you know assuming perfect heterodyne detection um so we are actually working on, you know, improving this uh, right now at the level of, you know, uh, experimental. If you're only, uh, if you only care about the verification protocol, uh, you can actually correct for uh, many errors like losses just by increasing the number of samples. So there are, um, like, there are two ways of looking at it. But either you can say I, I have some, you know, classical post-processing that kind of increased the efficiency of my heterodyne detector. Another way of of saying it is. Whatever detector you have, even if they're uh, not ideal, they have some, you know, bound distance uh, uh, in terms of operator norm with an ideal uh, heterodyne detector, and then you can you can kind of blame the state for this uh, distance. So you can assume that you indeed have these uh, perfect heterodyne, heterodyne detection and transfer all the error to the state preparation. So this is, uh, but but this second, uh, you know, uh, option only works if you you only care about the information about the fidelity because. Uh, I mean, for the quantum speed up demonstration, you still need to, uh, once you've certified the state, you still need to to, uh, to be able to measure it with some uh, other detection. So uh, in this case, um, for this uh, uh, detection model, we've not considered yet the, uh, the losses case. Actually, um, so this model, uh, our, our motivation for studying this model a few years back uh, was uh, more because we were trying to understand the Kind of power of non-Gaussian, uh, uh, the non-Gaussian elements in boson sampling. So in boson sampling, you have uh, the original boson okay. sampling, you have non-Gaussian input and the output. And um, uh, it was a bit at the same time that, uh, you know, the Gaussian boson sampling was uh, also developed, which you can think of the time reversal version of this model. And so it uh, kind of only came to our attention that this could actually be a useful model uh, beyond only its theoretical relevance uh, in this in this picture, but this is definitely something that uh, we want to have a look at. Uh, what about the approximate, uh, you know, uh, hardness version of this model? And if you have, uh, yeah, imperfect detectors. Thanks for the question. Okay, I, I see. Thank you. Can I have a very quick one? Uh, More? Do, you Do we need quick? the same local oscillator for all the heteronines? Okay. Uh, I mean, no. You you need the same local oscillator just for. I mean for the two homodynes within the same uh, heterodyne, but you don't care about, uh, yeah, you don't care about, uh, like for, for each mode, the local oscillator can be different, yes. Independent, okay, thank you. Yeah. We also have an online question. Uh, can you maybe unmute yourself and directly ask the question? Uh, Powell, can you hear us? I mean, I. Well, Otherwise, I have a problem with connection, I so I just put the question on the, I sure. put the, question on the because I'm on a train. I'm to, so please just answer to the question on the okay, okay, okay. Of no course, problem, no problem. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, so, yeah, maybe I, okay, okay. Yeah, sure, okay, sure, go ahead. Yeah, you can read it. Okay, okay. Answer. So the question, the question is, is there an easy way to understand why and how classical post-processing of the data outperforms tomography so strongly. So yeah, yes, there is one. Um, the reason is that we're targeting 
uh, boson sampling output states. And these states have a specific form. Maybe I can first show this slide. So this is the largest kind of class that we're able to verify efficiently. You can forget about the uh, single mode Gaussian operation here and just focus on this part. So here you have a passive linear operation and here you have a tensor product of pure states that have bounded support over the Fock basis. And so this, these are the states that we are able to verify. And the reason is as follows. So think that uh, if I were um, to, so the idea is to essentially reduce the verification to uh, verifying single mode states. And the trick is because we're using heterodyne detection and this is why we require this detection, we're doing, it's as if theoretically we're doing projection onto coherent states. And we can use the fact that coherent states, uh, you, you can think of uh, you know, time reversing this, this evolution, this measurement setup where I first apply um, you know, passive linear operation and then project onto a coherent state using heterodyne detection. You can you know, reverse engineer this and, um, and use the simple evolution rule for coherent states in a passive linear interpreter. They don't get entangled. They get mapped to uh, input coherent states um, with a simple evolution rule. And this means that effectively I can kind of, the verifier, the, the, the person trying to, to verify the boson sampling, one way would be to say, I first apply a U dagger operation because if the state was correctly produced, then I would kind of uh, reverse the entanglement by doing this and then uh, apply this Hedgestein detection. And, and so this would effectively reduce uh, verification to the, the single mode case. Now, the problem is we don't want the verifier to implement this, but because this is Hedgestein detection, you can show that this setup on the left is totally equivalent with this one, where you actually just measure everything with Hedgestein detection directly. And then on the classical post-processing side, you apply this uh, you know, evolution rule uh, classically. And so because these are you know, coherent states and amplitude in some sense, it's as if you had implemented this quantum operation, but or, like efficiently on the classical side. And so, um, yeah, and so this is the kind of the main idea. And then you can generalize this a bit uh, by you know, playing with the unbalancing and stuff to, to get to this larger class of uh, multi-mode state. But this is the, the main intuition. Like you, you have a post-processing post way to reduce to just verification of single mode pure states. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. We still have one question, yes? Okay, so, so I have the following question. I'm not an expert in this field, but I know uh, from my friend, Michał Szmaniec, that if you have losses in, in bosonic sampling experiment, yes, I mean, in some sense, it's classically easy then to, to simulate the statistics yes, from some level of loss. And now I'm a bit confused because from what you've been saying about this reverse way of looking at, at your measurement, somehow yeah. coherent, if you say you, you, you transform coherent states back, then they also transform easily under losses in principle. So, so I wonder how your certification procedure would behave if we had losses in our system. Would it tell us, oh, there are losses. We don't have, you know, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. we don't outperform any classical protocol. Yeah? Yes, exactly. So what would happen is that you would still get this, this estimate of the witness, but because your fidelity is no longer super good, uh, you would get an estimate of a W, uh, which is it, it in, in general, it, it would still be close to the fidelity, but you would get a value of the fidelity. I don't know, uh, uh, like a small value of the fidelity. And it would tell you your, uh, you, you can use this bound on this side and you, you can actually in general get better bounds than this. This is just like loose theoretical uh, bound. Um, you can use this bound to say, indeed, I'm in a regime where I'm actually not able to demonstrate uh, quantum speed up because, like, remember this, this any bound on the fidelity translate to the bound on total variation distance. And the criteria in the original, you know, Boson sampling proposal is you need to have some low constant uh, total variation distance here. So this, this translates to a, a close to, like, constant, but close, close to one uh, fidelity needed. And and again, this you, you would see this with your um, estimate W. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think we don't have any other questions. So thanks again. Let's thank you. Thank the speaker again. And <clears throat>